are they actually there because they're good or are they there because they have a fan base and they know more people are going to come in for that? Yeah, yeah, that's the scary, slippery slope. Man, if people are only hired because they have X number of followers, that that's not good. You should <laughs> Yeah, no. That that's like totally shifting um I mean, yeah, I mean, you can look at, say, hey, we want someone with a big social media following for so-and-so, but, I mean, oh, that's that, that's not good. That's not serving the product. Mr. Kyle Hey Bear, how's it doing? It is doing. It is going. And, uh, wow, here we are. Yeah. So bro. A uh, week in the making. At least I think a week in the making. Maybe two weeks in the making. Kyle Hey Bear, as everyone knows, um, Voice, how many how many roles do you have under your belt? If you were to count, would you say it's three digits or, or two di- two digits? It's uh, I I think easily in the three digits at this point. Yeah. What do you, <laughs> what year do you think you're hitting for? Oh my God! Uh, maybe this year. We'll have to see. Gosh, uh, with the number of games and shows that are being produced and 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 localized from Japanese stuff and yeah 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 yeah. It, so you're getting paid. It's a lot. It's good. I'm getting paid. Get paid, get paid. Okay, so now I'd like to thank you for your generosity of coming on here. And, and I see you do many, many interviews and, and many panels and, and things of that nature. And I feel that uh, not the voice acting industry, but the voice acting community sort of takes your generosity for granted and does not utilize it to bettering themselves with all the advice that you have in your mind. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and this has sort of manifested itself in you do an interview and it's the same three questions I hear every time. It's, what was your favorite character to voice? How do I get into voice acting? And what, what would you say is the third one? How did you get started? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They want to know how they can get started, and they also want to know how you got started. So okay. so that's like, that's like so it's just 2.5 questions, the same 2.5. And That's right. It, it's yeah. never something cool like, hey, what's your current ringtone? Yeah, no. I, I, we're actually going to get to that at the end of the interview. We're going to try to ask you questions you've never been asked on an interview. So we're going to have a segment for that. So don't worry. Um, oh, thank you. And the reason why this is sort of a disappointing to me is we run this show for a lot of people who are, are students of media who are trying to work in media and are always trying to learn and better themselves. And one of the very important things of that is the business aspect of things uh, and just understanding how an industry grows, evolves, and how to carry yourself and how to, how to network and how to properly present yourself. Um, now, and again, the business end, and it, it's just, um, you know, there, there's so many, I see so many chats where it's a bunch of guys who are in their mid 20s and they're always talking about, um, oh, oh, what's the new game coming out? What's, you know, what's the new anime, whatever. But you never hear them talking about, you know, investing in gold. You know, what's what's the new stock? You, you don't see that as much. And that's worrisome. Or, you know, what's going on in, in the career? You know, wh- what are they working towards? So let's try to keep it. Let's keep it business. Let's keep it, um, you know, good with that. Now. The first thing I want to get to, and we have a lot of aspiring voice actors who want to do this, and I usually see a certain pattern with aspiring voice actors. And the number one thing that I see, which I have a concern with, is when I see that their Twitter profile, social media, whichever, there's lots of cartoons on it. There's lots of, you know, and and I remember reading something on your website where it said when getting together your promotional images you don't want to have cartoony lips you don't want to have things of this nature because they make you sort of look like a you know they make you look like a fan rather than someone here to work uh can you uh, elaborate on that or, or speak to that a bit sure sure yeah um i used to have it on on my site where i'd heard about you know uh the big thing to market yourself with of course is a voiceover demo mm-hmm. namely a commercial demo um, and your brand is something that you do have to consider, uh, not only, you know, perfecting your and honing your craft, but how you present yourself in the world. Like you said, uh, if you work with a, a voice coach who, who knows their stuff or, or maybe they know someone in marketing, maybe they can help come up with defining what your brand is, what sort of imagery can be, uh, defined as accurate like if you see something bright and colorful are you going to hear a bright and colorful sort of delivery and and or something more muted or seem more more subtle and all that and the problem with with uh, cartoon lips and microphones and headphones is those are so cliche you know uh put putting that on your website i mean yes it does give the uh i mean to 
depending on what the audience is. You know, if it's yeah. fans or fellow VO, it's like, oh, this is a voiceover person. Mm-hmm. Uh, for clients or for talent agents, for casting directors, you know, they're not going to be floored or wowed by by some, uh, you know, something that they've seen time and time and time again, you know, uh, just like the content of the demo. It shouldn't be... Uh, consisting of the same types of uh, like here's my evil laugh and here's this and here's my impressions oh, and yeah, all this, the southern uh the southern country voice i have a friend who who's pinpointed that 70 percent of all male demo reels a uh, southern country voice is the second thing on every single one <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and i've noticed once i moved to los angeles that uh, accents aren't as heavily relied upon uh, in the pop culture media, as, as one might think. I mean, of course, there's exceptions. Of course, there's always going to be a need for a, hey, hey, how are you doing? You know, all that stuff. But, but by the by, the by, the the games are always um, usually looking for someone, you know, either an authentic Brit or or this or that, or they want to get they want to stray away from. You know, like, oh, well, this is Final Fantasy, so it has to have some sort of Shakespearean flair. And it's like, well, okay, maybe they're trying to be more modern with it. And you have to go with the flow. You know, you have to be ready for whatever the the casting folks throw at you. What are some big uh, no-nos that that you see committed a lot by people starting out in term solely in terms of self presentation? I always tell people on the convention scene and, and on, on social media that are asking about, you know, hey, I can't afford a demo or classes right now. Can I just record one at home and market that? And I always tell them, yeah, it's always, you know, the technology is affordable. So, yes, you can practice at home. By all means, do that. But the problem is you you lack the objectivity um, and, you know, when you play it for your friends and family, of course, they're going to tell you that yeah. you're great and yeah, talented. Yeah, 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 definitely. You know, uh, and, and a demo is showcasing the best of what you have to offer. Now, how do you know what you're best at if you haven't even taken a class, if you haven't worked to see what sort of uh, commercials uh, or are you best suited for? Uh, some people have the misnomer that voiceover requires you to have uh, be a jack of all trades and have you know hundreds and hundreds of voices and sub voices that you can can have a mental rolodex of and it's like that is not necessarily the case there there are tons of, of very successful voiceover people just using their own speaking voice uh, that can nab a certain sort of market. Uh, there's the youthful youthful market. There's the yeah. elderly. You know, like, why hire a guy who can sound like he's 20 and 60 when you can just go for maybe the demographic and bring in a 50 or 60-year-old talent? I yeah. mean, you're not going to try and I was about to. I was about to say, the. I think the... Is the richest guy to ever do it uh, LaFontaine, the movie trailer guy? <laughs> yeah, we, we lost him a few years ago, yeah. and he, he certainly was He just uh, did one voice. He was just one voice, yeah, but did, that worked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, was able to be, uh, you know, for in the decades past, just be limoed to every session. Yeah, and no. then at the end, not even leave his house. You know, it's like, oh, okay, a $10,000 gig here, 10000 like, in a world, one man, you know. And there's this whole, you know, a, a skew of, of VO people doing it, uh, including my friend, John Bailey, who's the Honest Trailers uh, movie guy. I mean, and a lot of success doing the, the movie trailers uh, and promos, as they're called, on TV. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, and that's no. something I would love to break into. I would love to do that. I mean, I've been a narrator on DBZ, and it's like that is a hard nut to crack. I mean, animation and, and all that because you've got all the old timers there and the veterans. And, yes, there's some new folks and some, even some folks from the anime world who've crossed over, but uh, it's tough. It's like you got to either retire or die <laughs> to find an opening practically. So one thing I, I, I've, I've sort of looked at it in the evol- evolution of the talent pool, and as far as – as far as anime dubbing goes, let's just let's just keep it there. Sure. What what would you say? Because um, we were speaking earlier, you don't want to come off as just a plain fan, and and you had you told the story multiple times of when you went in for the audition of uh, Dragon Ball Z for Gohan, you were wearing a I believe it was a bootlegged Dragon Ball Z T shirt. Is that correct? Yeah, it was an iron on that was like <laughs> lopsided and all that, and I actually genuinely thought that if I looked. If I came in there and presented myself as a fan, that they would take me seriously. And it's like, well, this guy knows his stuff. He's into it. He's going to be passionate about it. It's like I couldn't be any further than the truth. Chris Sabat told me once I was hired, they said, you know, we kind of visually just wrote you off, but we went ahead and humored you and went ahead and, and did the audition. It's like, well, I'm glad you did, man, because <laughs> yeah, no, it, I learned then that, uh, yeah, it, it is not about being a fan. Um 
you know, that's that that's great if you're a fan of something. But if you want to actually work in that industry, whatever it is, uh, the creative side, the business side, you're going to have to take classes. You're going to have to learn the ins and outs. And uh, you're there you know, to be an actor, not a not a uh, volunteer, I guess. As a, right. Uh, right. Yeah, no, the and, and not to just pile, not just to pile on the actors, but I, I also sort of try to when I talk to guys who are producing their own content uh, who might have a fan base with something, I try to always tell them, don't assume that anyone is a fan of anything you do ever because it's just, it's not going to come off great if you assume wrong. I'll always be under the assumption everyone is there to work, everyone is there to provide the best of what they have from themselves and not necessarily for a given franchise. Uh, right, yeah. And, yeah, and your audition is there to to serve as a hey, this is what it would be like to work with me. So yeah, yeah, you're it, it it's your prerogative, it's it's imperative to be as professional as possible. Show up on time. Do your homework if there's any. It's like read read the audition sides if they do send it to you ahead of time. So, uh, and obviously all the all all the 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 cliche stuff. It seems like the majority of the the talent that enters now is now we're in the generation where a lot of the actors who were going to do the younger roles, they were growing up on the cartoons or anime that they were, you know, that they were doing, that they're here for now. They grew up on those cartoons and anime. So right. uh, what would you say, what would you say is the percentage of fans in maybe 2002? And what would you say percentage of fans for dubbing is in 2018? Mm, I, I, well, it's a definite increase. It's hard to say percentage. I would definitely say that the newer generation was definitely raised on 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 anime and the, you know the first iteration of Toonami and all that. And you know, um, I think it's cool that fans you know uh, can can latch on to something that inspires them. Uh, to whatever professional career they want to do. And then you see them actually, well, you know, they came up through the ranks, you know, they paid their dues and and now they're working. So it's like there's there's, you know, they they are the ones who have taken it seriously. Whereas, uh, you know, I would say probably in the early 2000s, you saw more people coming from uh, theater uh, maybe on camera, you know, it was it was a it was a different thing because we didn't have social media. We didn't have a lot of VO talent interacting not only with each other but with uh, people that uh, fan bases that they may have have grown through whatever properties they they've been fortunate to work on. So, with being a fan, one thing that a lot of people would do to practice, and, and I guess still do, are fan dubs. You know, yeah. and, and so. Uh, this was fan dubs. Uh, if you were, if they found you doing them, or at least to my understanding, at one point in the industry, if they found you were doing fan dubs and you showed up to audition for the real thing, and they saw that, they would immediately write you off. They would throw you out. Uh, is that still the case? Have they lightened up on it over time? What's the deal with that? I don't know that, that there's any sort of unwritten rule about like, oh, let's just write off this uh, this person if they worked on fan dubs. But I do know the general consensus seems to be that fan dubs uh, and working on that can only really be seen as uh, just for fun. Uh, it's not viewed upon as professional work experience. It's not really training, and and it, it's great for fans to to try out, you know, their 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 hands at uh, doing lip sync and all that and everything. Uh, but it does not replace taking acting classes and workshops uh, and of course networking with with professionals who are who are in the fields themselves uh, there are more people now that did kind of come from a fan dub background to my understanding uh, Christina V uh, Kira Buckland um, but they're both very very successful professionally now so right. you know can I say that was because of their fan dub uh, base uh, or foundation I don't think so I think uh, I think they wanted it bad enough, and when you want anything bad enough, you'll 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 do uh, the sacrifices necessary. But th but think it this way: there's um w one theory uh, someone presented to me uh, a year ago about I was talking to somebody about this is a lot of the people who are coming in now they had already built a following on the internet, so at that point. Uh, so a lot of people sometimes question the talent of the newer uh, people who come in. And the, the theory is, are they actually there because they're good or are they there because they have a fan base and they know more people are going to come in for that? Yeah, yeah, that's the scary, slippery slope 
that uh, that we're kind of moving towards, where you're seeing like uh, this actress from Game of Thrones said, "Hey, I got this role because of how many followers I had." You know, just this off the cuff comment. It's like, oh my gosh, th- think about those. Wow, the the outcome of that sort of thing. It's like, man, if people are only hired because they have X number of followers. That that's not good. You should. <laughs> yeah, no. That that's like totally shifting. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, you can look at say, hey, we want someone with a big social media following for so and so. But I mean, uh, that's that that's not good. That's not serving the product. I, I think presenting yourself as a, a as a true professional, regardless of how many Twitter followers you have or Instagram or Facebook and. You know, uh, maybe, you know, social media is is kind of a necessary evil nowadays. A lot of people hate it, but they they have to embrace it because it is free marketing. It is a world in which we all use to communicate. So it is a tool. Another thing I want to touch on, again, with, uh, I guess, the newer actor evolution. The one thing I've noticed that that seems very different that I don't feel like I would have seen 15 years ago is... The concept of I see a lot of the actors who may get roles in professional things uh, now they show up and they're cosplaying and sometimes as cosplaying from the franchise that they voiced in. Does mm-hmm. that are, are there? Do you do you or do you see people who feel that uh, who have a concern with that in the ter- in terms of professionalism in terms of you know how are we how are we presenting ourselves are we presenting ourselves again the the fan or are you there because you know you know, you're here to work. I've never heard of it as anything problematic, you know, not from a licensing issue or the studios saying, hey, we didn't have permission for that. You know, uh, if anything, I've seen the fans really embrace that sort of thing. It's like, hey, not, you're not just an actor. You're one of us. And it's like, but I'm know. not talking about I'm not talking about the fan. And, you know, every now and then, yeah, I do things that make the fans happy. But I and, and this is this is the the sort of odd divide I see between Compared to voice acting and, uh, I guess, you know, film acting, I don't necessarily see Robert Downey Jr. show up in an Iron Man costume for a red carpet event, you know, stuff like that. Exactly. And so, exactly. And so that's that's what I'm wondering is, would you agree that as far as screen acting, would you agree that there is a far more established culture for screen acting than there is for voiceover acting? Uh, well, sure, sure. I mean, although historically a lot of the, the movie stars and TV people came from radio so yeah. you can say that they really did start off as as voiceover people uh before cinema was a thing but um and you yeah, started it, on radio a, i did i did you, uh and of ra- course radio is different now again because of the internet and yeah and all that and i just happened to, to to segue over and yeah it was it was uh you know i got very lucky of course right place right time right people uh with my audition uh and then you know just kind of uh, getting the radio part out of my system. I'd been on the air with Radio Disney for like nine years and then on everything from heavy metal to classic country before that. So so for all the 90s, you were there at Radio Disney? Uh, yeah, yeah. I was there on day one, which was Mickey and Minnie's birthday of uh, right. in like September or October of uh, 1996, went on the air and I was one of the one of the original DJs there and I helped work uh, on creative content and everything and helped... Uh, helped to establish that format which is still around today was that in orlando actually no but one of the one of the afternoon shows uh did have uh, talent from from disney world broadcasting oddly enough because of uh the cost of living and the cost of expenses uh it was actually happening and based in dallas texas which is where i was from oh, okay all right all right so it all makes sense all right okay so and, and obviously funimation is in the dallas fort worth area Oh, absolutely. So, so yeah, everything, yeah. everything when, Cohen's, that, that's good. That's good. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. When you have when you have uh, this number one show on Cartoon Network, which is DBZ, and then uh, Radio Disney's going, hey, what's hot with the kids right now? Oh, Cartoon Network. What's number one on Cartoon Network? Oh, Dragon Ball Z. So they take a tour. They find out about open auditions for in about the summer of 2000. And, uh, you know, thanks thanks to that heads up, I was able to, to, to go in and uh, a few months later, uh, I got I got Gohan. Started off with some bit parts and then kind of moved up and were you a um, here we are. Were you a live DJ on Radio Disney? I was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my Oop. my old air name was Squeege, 
And uh, I was at this this personality that would act like I'm on a big spaceship called the Intergalactic Boombox. And I would do a show with uh, Kara Edwards, who is now and has been the voice of Goten and Gotenks and Videl. Yeah, no, I, I saw I saw a couple panels or I saw one panel where you, you guys were up there together. I think it was in like Australia or something like that. Um, yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> Australia. Yeah, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think I'm ever going to Australia in my life. Uh, the, the, uh, but anyway, working as a DJ on Disney, you know, and, and my understanding of DJs is, you know, whether it be Colin Coward or uh, Howard Stern or, you know, that's my understanding of DJs. But uh, is, is when you're DJing, is Disney completely stomping on you creatively? Are you not able to really improv anything? Is everything pre-written? What, what's the deal with that? Well, there are standards and practices. You know, basically you, had a, you're, you fall under the guidelines of the FCC as far as what type of content is presented. But uh, I found creative freedom. I, I got to do the show I wanted to do, which was... Uh, basically summed up, if you want to just put it in bullet point form, is just like I'm Jim Carrey and Robin Williams just blended together. So I'm just okay. doing all these wild, zany voices while introducing things like Weird Al Yankovic and, and uh, you know, the boy bands in the late 90s, you know, popping up. Britney Spears, you know, the, the beginning of that. When Pokemon first came over to the States, I thought, wow, okay, yeah, so we're going to give away this. We've been doing a lot of stuff about that era lately, the whole... Uh... Uh, whole NSYNC, Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, Pokemon, like that. We've been we've been on the, a kick for that for so long. So I was I was yeah. waiting for you to get into that because I knew you. Were. <laughs> the uh, but anyway, <laughs> it's um let's uh let me get back to the business of voiceover. Sure. And I don't want to I don't want to count anyone's pockets. I don't want you to give a specific figure. But what I'm wondering is take take two equal amounts of work, uh for for Dragon Ball Z, one in 2000, one in 2018. What is the percentage increase from that first check to the last check that you got? <laughs> Anime in general is the the low end of the totem pole in terms of pay. You could get anywhere from as low as like twenty five dollars to to maybe upwards of maybe on average seventy five or so. There's always exceptions. You can make more. Uh, it it tends to be an hourly rate. Uh, if you go in for maybe a two hour session. You know, you, you get that. And obviously you can't pay rent based on just anime alone. A yeah. lot of the more, more successful people in VO uh, are definitely juggling many plates at once. You know, maybe they're writers, maybe they're directors, uh, they're, they're adapting scripts, they're maybe doing audio production of some sort, or maybe they're doing on camera or even working as baristas in Starbucks, you know, whatever to, to, to make ends meet. Right. Yeah, I just had a brain fart. I forgot where we were but get, going. But with getting this. all right, uh, I'll, two equal amounts of work. First check yeah. in two thousand for Dragon Ball Z to the last sure. check in two thousand for Dragon Ball Z in twenty eighteen or twenty seventeen, probably. Uh, it is better. It is. What, it is definitely improved. So yeah. would you say it's only increased due to inflation, not the industry getting bigger? Uh, I think it's only increasing due to, to, to personal circumstances. I mean, there's always going to be the, the right sort of uh, factors that fall into place, whether it's representation from a talent agent or uh, maybe a, a bonus situation or like, hey, it did this well. We're going to you know, bump the bump the bump the rate. I mean, there, there's there's all sorts of factors that could that could play into it. And that sort of leads me into uh, the the concept of negotiation as an actor, you know, doing a, an English dubbed anime, and that uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a hypothetical here, and uh, you tell me with your experience and your knowledge how it would play out. Okay. Um, so one of your, I guess, co-stars, uh, Sean Shamal, uh, mm -hmm. voice of Goku, probably. Uh, as far as America goes, probably the, the biggest anime character of all time, anime Jesus. And so <laughs> what I'm wondering is, let's say they do a game or let's say they do or let's say they're opening for Dragon Ball Super or whatever. With how this industry goes, let's say he says, I'm not doing Goku unless you give me X amount of dollars. What happens there? Does he get paid? Do they replace him? What goes on there? Well, yeah, there's a certain amount of clout and, and people making some sort of personal decision about, you know, like, I feel like I'm worth this amount. I feel that the property that we're working on has become this popular and let's spread the wealth. Let, let's let's all celebrate as a team together. Mm -hmm. um, 
so yeah, uh, you're going to see, you know, if it's popular, you're either going to have your original studio going, yeah, we're behind that and, and we'll support that idea. Or you could go backwards and say, nope, nope, well, we're keeping all the money and we're going to just pay at this rate. And if you don't accept that, then we'll find someone who will. But hopefully that clout is established. It is there. And people do know how controversial it is whenever you change yeah. uh, a dub cast, for example. If you, if you change the voice on a show or a game, um, you know, there's going to be, especially now with social media, there's going to be a huge backlash because of that instant pulse of the people saying, you know, Keeper Sutherland, come on, man, Metal Gear, Snake, come on, that's that's David uh, Hayter. You know, don't don't do this. You know, don't change uh, Powerpuff Girls. Right. You know, right. <laughs> that right, sort right. of thing. No, because I, I find that fascinating because, you know, again, 10 or 15 years ago before the Internet was, you know, blew up and had an opinion on everything, in theory, a major actor of Dragon Ball Z could have been replaced and they wouldn't have felt backlash simply because the the information wasn't out there back then. But like now, do, do you feel that the, the internet and people around, do you feel it's given you a, a better sense of job security with certain roles? I do feel that there is that. I feel also that the studios are listening much more to what the, the fan base is saying. So if they make the controversial decision to just replace people, just to save a buck or two, you know, figuratively speaking, of course. But, uh, you know, have it come out there. They're, they're, I mean, that could affect sales. I mean, you already have the Internet with, with piracy and torrents and all that stuff affecting actual sales figures in anime. Happens on the bigger scale with Hollywood, of course, and the music industry. But because anime is so niche that, uh, you know, you had studios, you know, close before because of this. But now you have new business models being developed with online and streaming. And now it is like the best time in the world uh, in general to be an anime fan. It's the most it's the cheapest, um, especially if you're just, you know, streaming with a subscription to Funimation or Crunchyroll or, or Netflix or Hulu even. You know, there, there's so much out there to choose from. I and, mean, yeah, not every single property is available in subbed or dubbed or, or whatnot or, or sometimes even uncensored. But uh, you know, generally speaking, it's it, it's a great time to be a fan. We, we live in an era where now anything somebody likes, they can get completely lost in it. Sure, and they they don't need they don't need to worry about anything else. Just they they either work their nine to five or they go to school and they go on the computer and they only need to worry about one thing for the next eight hours until they go to sleep. So it's a very <laughs> uh, it's a very uh, world's changed. World's definitely changed. The concept of, of voiceover panel or just panels in general at these conventions, because again now a million conventions have popped up. Uh, I guess Comic Con is would be the biggest one. Um, but uh, all these conventions have popped up, and I always see actors attending panels, whether it's for a show or it's for a general education thing. When when those actors show up to that, do, do they do that for free? Do they get a check? What's going on with that? I think generally a lot of guests, especially the more established ones, get some sort of appearance fee or what in the convention circuit on the pop culture side in any way is known as a guarantee, where... Uh, or the convention guarantees that that talent will make X amount uh, of merch sales. And if yeah. they breach below that figure, then the convention will cover the difference. And obviously, if they do better, then they get to keep that, too. Not not the con, but the talent. So uh, there's several business models in place. Um, uh, people just starting out may may not get any sort of money. I mean, yeah. they, they might just... You know, they get the hotel paid for and some food money or per diem and, uh, you know, the flight covered, obviously, and maybe, you know, Uber or Lyft and all that. And you look at it, it's like, OK, maybe I'm not making money, but I'm new to the scene and it's great exposure. And, you know, the more you get out there on the convention scene, you know, staff from one con will be going to another con and they'll 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 go into those panels and they'll start kind of you know, fishing for, for new talent to come to their convention. And they'll see, well, how does this person interact with their fans? Do they just, you know, disappear as soon as the signing's over? Or do they stay, you know, to make sure every last person gets yeah. an autograph? You know, that sort of thing. How much do you think they're taking home just for doing a one-hour panel? Golly. Well, I don't know if it's broken down into the panel so much because the convention is typically a two- or three-day oh, they Yeah, they, they walk around. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So, yeah, a couple hundred dollars, maybe a grand, you know, uh, it's depending on, on what the con's budget is, you yeah. know, and what they see your worth is as a draw. And some people are, it, 
you know, they think the whole it's a sticky situation with like, oh, why are you guys getting paid to do that? You know, aren't you making enough money at your at your session fee? It's like wait, people say that? anime. No. Do people actually like come to you and they tell you you're not allowed to get paid to arrive for this? Well, no, no. I mean, I haven't had the problem from from fans. I've I've actually heard from within some of the community, within like either staff or or maybe even other guests. It's like, hey, man, just show up for free. You should be <laughs> glad to do this. And it's like, well, look at it this way. Here is why guests basically are are given some sort of compensation. If we have to take off on a Thursday or Friday to travel across the country, we're giving up potential work. We we may have to give up a session, or uh, writer directors well, may even give up even more money. So it, you, it's not even that. that. It's just it's just you're you're the star of the thing. If they want people to give them money, you know, I, I assume the convention is making money. You should also be <laughs> making money. If you know, if somebody asks you show up to my convention and they're getting fifty dollars a ticket for the convention, you know, it's it's a concept of sharing. The you know, the conventions are a business too. I don't know why people don't think the conventions are also a business. <laughs> it's, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You got to cover the venue, which is expensive. You got to cover the insurance for the venue. You got to cover uh, uh, so many things that a lot of the staff are all volunteer and everything. They're in, typically most cons aren't a paid sort of situation for the people running it. So yeah, yeah. You look at it. Uh, it's like, hey, what's fair? Because you're using, for example my name to help sell badges to help yeah, get exactly. people to show yeah, up exactly so if they if if they were able, able to break it down and say okay the 50 more people showed up well that's 50 more badges you sold so how about a percentage of that so i mean, mean yeah it's all you can't ever really tell unless it's just a super duper established uh, convention you know what sort of numbers to expect but you know like you said they're popping up left and right a lot of first time events some do well enough to continue others completely f- crash and burn on day one right give me give me a quick yes or no on on the next couple of things about that have you ever done comic-con I have not gone as a guest. I've gone as an uh, okay. I got an industry badge and went. But yeah, um, I've, I've what about a have you ever done an anime expo? Yes. Okay, so that's a really big one. Oh yeah. Um and I'm assuming you've done smaller ones. Oh yeah, I've been ones as small as maybe 100 people or less. <laughs> so, are you asking for a bigger amount from Anime Expo than the other smaller conventions well you, you have to put your gonna... feelers out you have to put your yeah. feelers out sometimes they will they will say you know in their introductory email it's like hi we're with so-and-so con and you know here's what we're offering uh and then i'll reply back with like well you know i'll think about it it's like well am i willing to go for that amount i mean is it a part of the country i've been to before would i like to visit do it you know something like that or yeah. something maybe overriding that is like well let me think about the exposure what would the uh, what sort of thing and yeah yeah they exposure mean, uh-oh there's <laughs> that's a that's a slippery word in uh, this industry <laughs> oh no yeah yeah no All right yeah. jesus christ okay so uh let's see uh now when you go to these panels i see you know i'll, I'll watch a few of these over the years i just i watch panels of, of people who you know whether it be you or somebody else you know I, i've watched guys and I always see videos captured of like uh, of a fan being very uncomfortable or, or I guess making the guests very uncomfortable. They always like show up and, you know, they'll, they'll be a little weird. They'll they'll sound a little stalkerish because, you know, that happens with some guys. How would you as a guest or how do you see guests deal with that? Well, obviously, if they if they're too creepy, you've got the, the guest handlers and staff security and all that will we'll step in. But I mean, by and by and large. Most of the interactions with fans are overwhelmingly positive, supportive, and and, and not creepy, and 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 not like awkward and and everything. I mean, I it, it's important to me, and I think this is true for a lot of people that are guests at conventions. The the interaction with fans is such a minute part. You know, whether it's saying hi, shaking hands, signing an autograph, you know, for a minute or two of their time, you want to leave a good impression on them. You 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 don't want. You, you, they always say, "Don't meet your heroes." Not to say that voice actors are heroes, but you know what you, what I'm saying by <laughs> yeah, the no, comparison. I get it, I get it, yeah. It's like you want to meet so and so celebrity, and then you hear that they're a total jerk to the fans. It's like, oh, really? I mean, it sounds like they hate their job and they, they don't like the fans, and they don't want to be there. I don't know. Some with with some circumstances, you know, there's, there's a lot of celebrities who get called, you know, 
Aragon or, or you know or, or stuff like that. But I mean, I personally look and see where they came from, and if it's uh, you know, sometimes I, I feel it's justified. Other times it's like no way. Like like let's mm-hmm. say you know if somebody if someone's there because you know they're like third generation wealth and you know they're acting very you know arrogant disrespectful fan you know I'm like yeah screw that guy but if it's like if it's a person who came from nothing and they're just you know they worked real hard and they're just sick of everything they're just sick of the BS you know I don't I don't mind it as much one thing one thing I want to ask and uh, I, I ask you to name names because I don't feel this is very, uh, you know, this is a huge sin. Uh, okay. Are you familiar with uh, Howie Mandel and how he's like a germaphobe and he always demands like yeah. fist bumps and stuff like that? Which voice yeah. actors are like Howie Mandel with that, where they don't want to, they don't want to actually touch hands because they're afraid they'll like get sick or what? Because they're, you know, their voices how they make money. Yeah. So, uh, do you oh, know God, any voice yeah. actors who are like that? Which ones? I. I actually don't know who, and I'm, I'm not trying to do cop out or, or protect anyone's identity here. It's like I seriously don't know of anyone that that only does fist bumps because they're germaphobe. But I do. Uh, I can definitely say that that every single guest that I know, whether they're voice actors or animators or writers, even the Japanese talent, they all have plenty of hand sanitizer, and. Yeah. Uh, it's important to practically take a bath with that stuff because if anybody gets the con plague after day three, they know how how crummy that feels. Especially if your if your job is to speak and suddenly you sound like you know Marge Simpson or something the next morning. The- the surgical mask that's getting really big in New York City. Are, are you starting to see people? Uh, are you starting to see guests do that at conventions yet? Yeah, initially you would see Asian people doing that, and it's like, okay, that's that's different. And then more and more people are starting to do it. It's like, hey, thank you for being considerate of the of the general public and all that. Or, or you know, if you know you're sick, don't don't extend your hand out and then tell them after they shake it. It's like, yeah, I'm just getting over the <laughs> yeah, flu. Yeah. Don't mind me. Yeah. What's a um. Let's go a little existential here. What's a piece of advice you've always wanted to give to potential voiceover talents, but were never prompted to, never been asked to, that you wish you were always asked to? Mm, gosh, I don't know what. <laughs> I, I usually try to just give everything I can when that when that common question comes around. And I think the one that I feel the most passionate about is do your research. Do your research is a very blanket general statement, but I also mean like if you're going to pick up and move, that requires money. And money requires saving money and <laughs> having a day job and, and not having the the deer in the headlights sort of, uh, oh my gosh, I'm just going to get off the bus in Hollywood and it's just all going to fall into place. Yeah, That doesn't happen. I mean, yeah, there's probably two out of every three billion, right? You know, there's, mm-hmm. but you got to rely on and it, and here's the scary part there it's all risk and and no reward guaranteed you know uh yeah, no. some people may have success after a few months some may take 10 years to be an overnight success uh but i i think man if i could go back i would have saved a lot more money uh because i went broke in in, in a few months and that affects you know your 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 mental attitude your you know your your, your faced with not only crippling debt but depression and yeah. and all that and you know yeah you may have a nice support group of friends or family and everything but uh if the work's just not coming you know you got to have a plan b uh what sort of day job are you are you willing to get um do you know a lot of actors who might have been homeless at one point doing it I haven't met any that said they were homeless. I, I know that they've, they've all come from, you know, crappy day jobs, maybe couriers or, you know, yeah. uh, just, just, you know, your hourly average, you know, retail job or whatever that that is generally frowned upon. But everything. But but it's those important gigs that that people work their way up to. And it's like, all right, this is this is an important thing that I have to do. I'm paying my dues. And, uh, you know, if anything, it's character building. You know, it's just yeah. part of the thing. I mean, you will you will appreciate success much more if it's not just handed to you. Yeah. You know, if you actually work for it, you'll actually appreciate and respect it more. And because I, I always talk about voiceover industry versus voiceover community when when people talk to me about this stuff is that uh, there you you get so many people who act like they're already famous. 
you see a lot of that when you know all they've done is like minecraft fan dubs or whatever you know you see a lot of that <laughs> and it, it's uh you know you definitely notice a difference between the people who had been working for years and years at it and the people yeah. who got one lucky role that happened to be like a youtube hit and now they have like 10,000 twitter followers and they don't they don't work on their craft as much they don't uh they don't come off as punctual they don't you know you, you see that so much you see that so so much and so, yeah, yeah, no, that's that's definitely very true. And I feel like the concept of a work ethic is probably the least discussed thing uh, as far as the voiceover community goes, because, you know, there's so much the majority of the people online that you see, they're all trying to learn. Right. They're not they're not making money yet. Right. Right. And so I, I feel that that is the most under discussed thing is the concept of a work ethic and the concept of at the end of the day, not to say that the labor is not important, but at the end of the day, if if you're saying words into a microphone, you know, that's not that's not ditch digging. You know, you should try to do that as much as possible. Right. You know, because <laughs> what's it called? It's uh, would you say that with voiceover? The hard work isn't so much the labor itself when you get to the booth, but all the years of work that led up to it. Oh, absolutely. The, the, the respecting the process, getting to that point. You know, so many people will, will say, hey, you guys make it look so easy. It's like, well, we are actors. You know? it's <laughs> yeah. like we get up there and it's like, yes, we absolutely love it. It's a fun job. It doesn't feel like work, but you have to work to get to that point. You have to practice your craft. You have to stay on, on top of the trends. You have to network. You have to not become complacent uh, and, and and just keep the ball rolling. You know, you often hear, it's like, don't pay attention to that man behind the curtain. But in this case, it's like, please stare at the man behind the curtain. Respect the man behind the curtain yeah. <laughs> because you got to be the man behind the curtain first before you can go on stage and get all the glory. Preparation. Um, oh, and that's huge. So huge. And, and that helps weed out a lot of people. It was It's kind of so like you see the lights start to dim. That it's like, what? I have to work at this? I just thought I could do impressions and be no, a voice yeah, actor. Yeah, I, like, nope, 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 nope. No, I've, I've, I've easily seen a lot of people just give up instantly once they actually <laughs> know what it costs to, to do. Yeah. You know. The number goes down from 200 to 20. And then from that 20, you know, maybe you'll see the next year, if you come back to the same con, you'll, you'll see a couple that were at the same panel going, hey, I've taken a class or I've taken, you know, X number of classes, and now I'm working on my demo. It's like, wow, that's awesome. It's, it's always great to interact with people whose passion is is the same as yours, and they're, they're really driven, and they really want this so bad that, you know, you, you don't see yourself doing anything else. Something, uh, I would assume the majority of your work has been, do you ever attempt uh, directing? Have you been hired to direct? I've not been hired to direct. I haven't even been given an opportunity. Then again, I haven't really expressed an, uh, you know, yeah, uh, an interest yeah. in doing it. I would like that opportunity. Of course, the downside is, you know, you're 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 stuck in the booth and you're not available for voiceover gigs yeah, no. once you're doing that. But you are orchestrating a project and I think that would be fascinating. I think anyone who's been doing voiceover long enough um would would have a at least a, a shot at it, you know, right. maybe uh, I, would, I would I would like to, I would love to to direct something someday. I would say I would say the majority of the work I mean I don't I don't do a lot in voiceover but I would assume think the majority of the work I've gotten is directing as opposed to acting and I would say that the thing about classes I try to scout town a lot and yep. sometimes when I hear I've taken a lot of classes sometimes I get worried when I hear that because there's the concern of someone learning bad habits what I what I would say is it's easier to teach good habits than to unteach bad habits than reteach good habits do you feel that there's a lot of classes out there that may not be very reputable and may actually be harming actors? Yeah, I think I think uh, there are the cases of snake oil salesmen, just people trying to make a quick buck and uh, people just saying, here, take my money. You know, I want to take the, 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 sh the shortcut, the easy, the fast route. And that is absolutely, you know, steer clear of that. Run away from from that. Uh, you're not going to suddenly be a seasoned actor because you took a class over the course of a weekend or anything like yeah. that. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
Yeah, uh, you know, working on the demo, yeah, you'll learn about the anatomy of the demo and all that, but honestly, that part of the process comes after learning and working with a voice coach and finding out what your strengths are and learning what you should have, uh, what sort of uh, different excerpts on your demo should should best represent what you have to offer. And right. again, you know, what you need to first put out there is a commercial demo if you're looking for representation uh, and then uh, worry about the character's uh, stuff because the character stuff is so limited to begin with. Yeah, no. um, you know, an agent's not going to sign you because you do great character work. I mean, they're in it to make money too. And the most lucrative form of voice work is commercials. Let's, uh, let's, let's sort of wind it down now. Uh, let's get to some questions you've never been asked on an interview, whether it be a panel okay. or whatever. Sure. Uh, let's see here. And, and let me know if you've ever been asked before and we can, you know, we'll, we'll see how we're doing. Okay. <laughs> All right. Favorite professional sports team. Ah, uh, I'm not really into sports. <laughs> have you ever been asked that, though? I, I have been asked that. I, really? I, Where? Yeah. Oh, God, I forget. I've got, I've got first world problems. I've been to so many cons, I don't even remember where it was asked. But it has been asked multiple Fair times. Enough. Like, who are you rooting for? It's like, uh, the one that wins? I don't know. All right. Favorite pop star of the last 20 years? Mm, pop star. Ever been asked that? Uh, no, I have not. There we go. We got one. Okay. Yeah, you do got one. Uh, I don't know if it's. Does it have to be pop music, or can it just be music in general? Uh, it's got to be. It's got to be someone that's like popular. It's got to be someone. That, I say pop star, so it's not like somebody obscure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Gosh, I don't know. I did have a guilty pleasure in Lady Gaga, but. Um... Okay, Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga. She holds it down. Okay. When you go to McDonald's, what do you order? Uh, I don't go anymore because <laughs> I'm on a diet. No, McDonald's is really I do healthy. Go, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I would go, I would get like a uh, sausage egg McMuffin. Uh, and their fries are to die for. I love their fries. Well, they used to be good. Uh, they got rid of the, yeah. n- n- the vegans ruined it. Uh, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> and uh, let me ask you a question you've been asked a million times. Uh, could you uh, say something in a Dragon Ball voice for us? I'll say this in a Dragon Ball voice because I can do that on So Bro Radio. That's pretty good. Uh, can I give you a? Everybody always asks for the narrator in Gohan. Could you read something for us as the Ox King? Uh, sure. What do you want to hear? Okay. So, uh, so <laughs> just I, I, I pasted it right there. If you could read that for us, uh, it'd be fantastic. Oh, uh, hey, Michael Moore here, reminding you to buy the new CVS hot dog rotisserie machine. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> no, because we, um, anytime for the last like five years, anytime we watch that show, Ox King, we just see that as Michael Moore. We don't even see that as Ox King. So that's, that's funny uh, because I always see him as like a derpy Macho Man Randy Savage. But, you know, that too. There's a lot of Macho Man char- inspired characters in Funimation, oh, I've noticed. Oh, totally. Yeah. Najirobi. Yeah. The, uh, uh, the, the, Kuwabara. Yeah, Kuwabara. Yeah, it's the Blake Griffin. Yeah, no, him. No. The, uh, have you heard that? Have you heard? Um, I mean, this is sports, but uh, did you ever hear about uh, how Blake Griffin on the Los Angeles Clippers uh, looks exactly like Kuwabara? Ah, uh, no, I actually haven't heard that. Although I am hearing, you know, UU fans coming out of the woodwork, which is nice because that show definitely deserved more attention than it got. I would probably say that was my favorite thing out of Funimation. I think. Yeah, no. <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't worry hey, about what, it. Hey, whatever resonates, man. That, that's that, that's awesome. You know, all I know is, you know, I get while I say I don't really follow sports. Uh, some people may not consider this sports. I do. But wrestling, I like professional wrestling. And in in these these more recent years, you've seen more wrestlers come forward and be huge anime fans. You know, Cesaro and Sheamus doing the fusion dance as part of their intro. The New Day dressing as Saiyans. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, I mean, you, well, you know, you get that in a uh, specifically uh, basketball and football. You get that a lot. Uh, the oh God, uh, Devin Thomas, he was on the uh, he was on the New York. He had a full uh, I think it was a full back Goku tattoo. Uh, oh, nice. You get a lot nice. of it, every rapper likes Dragon Ball now. Um, I just use the media term, so I'm going to hell. But uh, let's see here. Yeah, no, every MC likes Dragon Ball. Every R&B artist likes Dragon Ball. Anybody anybody born in 1990 onward, because that's just that's just always on. You know, I, I knew uh, I, I worked for uh, I worked for a mixtape guy um, born in 1982, and he had a Vegeta tattoo uh, where where Vegeta was uh, going Super Saiyan and making basketballs come out of the ground. 
you know, ton, tons of stuff. And, you know, again, culturally, did you ever predict that you were being a part of something that would become in this era? You know, Dragon Ball is more important than Superman. It's it's more important than Iron Man. It's more important than all of those for people born in the 90s and onward. Did you project that at all? Could you have seen that coming at all? No, no way. I mean, all I wanted for me was my personal goal of getting to work professionally as an animation voice guy. And, you know, yes, that came true. And yes, I've crossed over from anime to video games. I've done a little bit of cartoon work, not as much as I would like, because that's that that's my first love. But uh, could I have predicted how how big even Dragon Ball Z was back in the day? No, I mean, number one trending for back then, the Cartoon Network ratings, the merchandise sales, the fandom, the way, you know, how, you know, some things that are just a part, they're ingrained so deeply in the culture that they never really go away. Even if the people grow up and say, hey, I don't watch it or I don't play that anymore, but it was a part of my childhood. 20, 25 years, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be on, not Kimmel, but, you know, you could probably get asked to be on the Tonight Show or Late Show because you got to think of it this way. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, oh, Dragon Ball isn't a and people use the um, the Dragon Ball Evolution movie as an example of how oh Dragon Ball isn't popular enough to get uh, mainstream attention from the big corporations. But what I try to explain to people is that. Everyone who like everyone who takes Iron Man and all that other stuff, I, I I hate all comic books. I hate all that. I've I've only liked the stuff that came from Japan because it was one timeline. It wasn't like a million different stories at the comic book rack. Uh, Fair enough. But the uh, what's it called? What I try to explain to people is, you know, anime just blew up in the year two thousand, and it's you know it's moving on forward, and now we're seeing athletes really like it. It's only a matter of time before studio executives also grew up with that. And they they put as much money into that as they do, you know, an Iron Man or a Spider Man, because those came out 60s and 70s. Right. So I would say, well, yeah, you know, I would say wait like 20 more years. You know, you're going to be on, you know, whoever takes over for Conan or whoever takes over for um, who's the, who's the old guy, whoever takes over for Colbert. You know, you know, don't be surprised if you get asked onto one of those shows. Yeah, I mean, we're already seeing, you know, the the booming of anime as as we are in the digital age and people are, you know, binging is now a word as you know, that refers specifically to watching a show in one weekend or whatever. And now that that Netflix sort of uh, ethic is there, now people like Netflix and Amazon and Hulu are latching on with exclusive shows, even Crunchyroll and Japanese uh, animation companies are partnering with U.S. or North American companies uh, to get the product out there quicker. Or in the case of Funimation with Simuldub stuff in Japanese and English at the same exact time. There so was, yeah, yeah, you're right. Absolutely, absolutely. In 20 years, I mean, hopefully we'll we'll not we'll have. This is just me speaking. I hope we have less and less uh, live action adaptations of anime, because <laughs> I don't know. I just they just don't really work, and they don't make a lot of money anyway. Well, here's the here's the theory. Here's the theory. They could work. They could absolutely. First, you can make a good movie out of anything. Period. If if it's a good filmmaker who understands the content, you can make a good movie out of everything. Is it going to look exactly like? Let's use Dragon Ball Z as the example. Is it going to look precisely like Dragon Ball Z? No. They have to change it up to make it, you know, make sense to regular people. You know, people who don't know all about Dragon Ball. But the thing right. is, is that when we get to the age where you know the majority of filmmakers who are running everything right now born in the 60s and 70s again yeah. and so when you get to the era when the filmmakers are born in the 90s and 2000s what you're going to see is they they grew up with the franchise so they'll know what can be taken away what will you know what they can take away while still keeping the original purpose of the series intact and also making it uh, consumable for the average viewer who may not know as much about Dragon Ball. Right. I, you know, so you get, um, so like, for example, um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't expect you to co-sign what I'm about to say, cause you got to be politically correct with everything. But, uh, you know, the fan films that come out now for Dragon Ball Z, you know, they might be big fans. They all suck. They, they're horrible films. They're terrible. I don't, I don't care what anyone says. They're not good. But then you get Dragon Ball Evolution where, this uh, I think it was the guy who did Final Destination, James Wong. I'm not sure, but that guy, yeah, he's a great filmmaker. He's a fantastic filmmaker, but he doesn't care about Dragon Ball. He doesn't know what that is. 
you know, it, it, the, all of that is completely foreign to everyone working on that movie. So my theory, again, my theory is wait 20 years and the next Quentin Tarantino will have grown up with Dragon Ball Z, not uh, Spaghetti Westerns. <laughs> and so, and That's so true. good anime movies will happen. They will absolutely happen, but you just got to wait for, you got to wait for the years to progress. Cause you, yeah, think about that spider. Wasn't there like a Spider-Man TV show in the seventies that looked terrible? Oh, it was terrible. I was growing up in the seventies and I watched it and it's like, this is awful. I even but, knew as a kid, it was awful. But now in 2002, now you see Spider-Man. Now it's like a good movie. Now it's like, wow, this is real. Wow. Sam Raimi's a genius, right? But that's because Sam Raimi, oh, totally. he had the genius of a filmmaker and he had the appreciation of, of what Spider-Man represented. So that's, Absolutely. that's my theory. I feel people just get impatient. And it's like, you just got to wait another decade or two, and then you're going to start getting the good stuff. So th this is where being a fan comes in handy, right? These people will rise through the ranks of all the bean counters, and then <laughs> they'll be in charge of saying what gets greenlit at the studios. And yeah. like, yeah, precisely. Okay. And, and, and because, right. because Dragon Ball is so big, you don't necessarily need to be a huge fan. You just need to have a fondness for it. And so, you know, right. just naturally, naturally, people born in the 50s will die. Uh, you know, people born in the forties will die. <laughs> you know, we, no one's going to live forever. So it's eventually going to switch unless there we you figure go. you know, but anyway, okay. <laughs> um, that's my theory on that. I just, I just wish, um, people got to be patient. That's it. Anyway, Kyle Haybear, legendary voice actor. Do you go with legendary? Oh. Do you like that as a title? No, I'm too humble, man. I can't, I, can't. I, I say I'm a guy, I'm a, I'm a, a laid back dude with a really cool job <laughs> that okay. I work on legendary properties. I'll take that. Okay. Uh, voice of legendary properties, voice of legendary characters. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, no, cause, oh God. Cause I, I mean, you, you, you voice Gohan. There's uh, what was it? Budokai two. I, I played that so much when I was a kid. I was, I guess I was stupid or something because I would always play in practice mode on those games cause they couldn't hit you back. So like, I liked just no confrontation whatsoever. So I would always do the Gohan, uh, the, the, the super Kamehameha's or whatever. I would always do those constantly. So I, I heard that like over and over again. So that's uh, it's great to touch base with you. Uh, maybe we could uh, have you back if we're doing something uh, little, uh, little different. Who knows? Anyway, okay, that sounds great, man. I appreciate it. This has been fun, Mr. Kyle Haybear. Great talking to you. I'll, uh, I'll see you later. All right, man. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. bye, -bye. That was a nice interview. Was it Jr.? Was it a nice interview?